just need to spin. Okay. So what's happening today is I'm uh, testing out my phone as a potential alternative microphone. I was using it for the last video I did. Um, so just let me know if the audio quality is any better. Um, this doesn't record in stereo, it records in mono. So um, I'm having to double up the tracks, but I don't know if that actually makes it sound any different. Um, but it allows me to put the camera a bit further away so you can see my arm gesticulations and things. Now, this video is a little bit cobbled together because I've just come back from university. I wasn't actually able to record while I was there. Um, but I think um, I think the ideas uh, I'm going to talk about are quite interesting and they provide a good foundation for sort of um, looking at and thinking about animals in Anglo-Saxon England. Um, and of course, animals would have been on the Anglo-Saxon mindset an awful... Uh, or rather the Anglo-Saxon mind an awful lot because... Uh, they lived in a heavily agricultural society and anyone who lives in a modern agricultural society who is directly involved in agriculture, a huge amount of their thought and a huge amount of what they talk about is going to be dominated by livestock and crops. But that does not mean that wild animals were not important to the Anglo-Saxons as well and it doesn't mean they didn't carry symbolic meaning. Um, a lot of the animals you'd find in Anglo-Saxon Britain are the same kinds of animals you'd, ex you'd expect to find in Britain today. So you'd have mammals like foxes and badgers, uh, hedgehogs, stoats, weasels, things like that. Um, amphibians like frogs and toads uh, and newts as well. I'll put a video of a toad we found at the start of this video. As you can see, a lot smaller than some species of toad that exist outside the UK. Um, and you'd also have reptiles like snakes, um, occasionally lizards. The snake situation was broadly similar to how it is in modern Britain, so the only seriously venomous snake here is, uh, is the adder, and that was the case in the Anglo-Saxon period as well, as far as we know. Um, but adders are very manageable. They're really not that much of a problem. If you, if you get bitten by one, there's a possibility that you might, um, you might die if you're, if you're weak or if you're old or, or whatever, but um, they're not something people really fear. Um, generally speaking. Um, the thing about modern British wildlife, speaking of which, is that there are very few actually dangerous animals. So the red fox is pretty much the only dangerous, um, well, the most dangerous species of predatory animal you're likely to come across nowadays. And aside from very, very occasionally attacking small children, they're really not a serious threat to anyone. Um, you're really more likely to be attacked by a large herbivore that's protecting its uh, children than you are to be attacked by an actual carnivore. Um, speaking of which, the Anglo-Saxons would have had or would have known a much smaller range of deer species than we have in modern Britain. So I think there are five or six species of deer in Britain today uh, that are wild. But the only two species of deer that were endemic to Anglo-Saxon Britain were the roe deer and the red deer. Uh, and actually, as I've mentioned in an earlier video, the very earliest inscription we have in a language that could be called English says roe, as in roe deer. And it's written on one of the ankle bones of a roe deer, I think, the Astragalus. Um, You'd also have had wild boar, which were um, extinct for quite a long time in Britain. They were reintroduced about 20 or 30 years ago. But throughout the Anglo-Saxon period, wild boar would have been scattered about. Um, and you would have had beavers, which again have been recently reintroduced to the UK, but they would have been around in the Anglo-Saxon period quite common. And the European wildcat, which is now only um, restricted to a few very small pockets of Scotland, um, would have been a lot more widespread as well. Um, and wildcats are very different from domestic cats, although they look similar. They can't be raised or tamed. They're very aggressive and they don't like humans at all. One thing that would be different is there would be no rabbits. So rabbits, although they seem like they should be endemic to Britain, they're actually an invasive species introduced by the Normans, I think by accident. Um, but you would have had hares. The two significant species that people seem to be most interested in are bears and wolves. And both of those species did exist in Britain during the medieval period. The brown bear, which is the only bear species that's, that's existed in Europe, this side of sort of the Paleolithic, probably died out in the very early Anglo-Saxon period. And even then, it probably would have been pretty rare. So the majority of Anglo-Saxons probably never saw a living bear in their lives. I mean, even think about the US or certain countries in Europe that still have bears. I, I dare say the majority of people in those countries have never seen a wild bear, even though they are theoretically there. So. Um, I don't think it's unreasonable to say most Anglo-Saxons probably have never seen a bear. Um, of course, a lot of English folk stories make reference to bears, but I suspect um, a lot of those were probably carried over from the continent or got imported to Britain 
uh, later on. But wolves, on the other hand, actually persisted, as far as I know, throughout the entirety of the Anglo-Saxon period, although they might have been rare in a lot of places. The problem people generally have with wolves in agricultural societies is not that they attack people, but that, that they attack livestock. So I think the, the, the biggest problem with wolves probably wouldn't be wolves attacking people, but wolves attacking sheep and making off with, you know, making off with goats and things like that. Every culture has its own way of viewing the animals it comes into contact with, and obviously the Anglo-Saxons were no different. So one animal that pops up a lot in Anglo-Saxon literature is the wyrm, and this word is an example of another culture taxonomizing things differently than we do nowadays. So the word wyrm could describe a snake, a worm, a maggot, or it could describe a folkloric creature resembling one of those things, like a sort of serpent. So the word is translated uh, as dragon or serpent in a lot of texts. Um, and I think dragon is probably a bad translation here for reasons I'll explain in, uh, in a minute. So while we, from a modern biological point of view, would recognise these things as all being very different to each other, an Anglo-Saxon might recognise them to be variations of the same kind of animal. And the fact, they uh, and the fact that they categorise mythological serpents under the same umbrella term suggests to me they probably didn't regard them as mythological. And that's why I think dragon is probably a bad translation. So there's no evidence in Old English literature that they actually consider these things to be not real. Um, and although that's not founded on a huge amount, I don't think it's necessarily a bad analysis, because after all, there are plenty of animals that the Anglo-Saxons would have been aware of, but probably never seen, that we would acknowledge as real animals. So, for example, most Anglo-Saxons, as I said, probably would never have seen a bear, but they were all aware that bears existed. Most Anglo-Saxons probably never saw a whale, but they all you know, were aware that whales existed. Um, so I, I don't think we should automatically analyse these giant serpents as being something ang the Anglo-Saxons thought were mythological. And they were definitely aware of the dangers of adders in particular. So one of the more famous metrical charms, uh, charms the Nine Herbs Charm, is a remedy for um, poison. And part of the charm is that it describes an encounter between the god Woden and an adder. And it says Woden struck the snake into nine separate pieces using these nine plants, possibly implying the charm is meant uh, for snake bites, among other things. Um, as for amphibians, I'm not aware of much reference to frogs or toads or newts in Old English literature outside of Bible translations. Of course, any farm that's near a body of water, you will find toads hiding under things, um, hopping about. Um, and that's, that's true today, and it probably was back then as well. Um, so Butser Ancient Farm, where I volunteer sometimes, has an Anglo-Saxon house, um, and you do sometimes find toads that have just wumbled their way into the Anglo-Saxon house and hidden under floorboards and things, and they will piss on you if you try and pick them up, if you wanted a little snippet of daily life there. Going by archaeological deposits, people in the early Anglo-Saxon period don't actually seem to have hunted very much, um, at least not big game like deer and wild boar, so those things make up a very small percentage of bone assemblages. And where you find evidence of red deer, it's mostly antlers. So it seems like people probably hunted the odd roe deer for meat, but the vast, vast majority of the meat they consumed was livestock. Wild animal skins were definitely utilised because we find fragments of them attached to things. So um, beavers, wolves, foxes, badgers, um, and even bears occasionally, although bear skins might have been imported in the early Anglo-Saxon period, were probably hunted for skins and claws and things like that. Um, Throughout the Anglo-Saxon period, ordinary communities were consuming a lot of wild birds. Um, and although you don't get fantastic representation of this in the archaeology, just because the bones of wild birds don't survive very well, um, you do get quite a lot of representation nonetheless. So I think it's fair to say it's probably fairly commonplace to hunt wild birds. And that became much more of a high-status thing as the Anglo-Saxon period went along. Um, and animals are also depicted on a lot of Anglo-Saxon jewellery, sometimes in a quite abstract way. So the line between animal and human is often not very clearly defined in these depictions. You find motifs made from parts of various animals, including humans, with you know, an unusual number of limbs or an unusual number of heads. Um, and this sort of thing is actually found very widely in non-Western cultures where it often reflects an animistic view of nature. And by animism, I mean seeing personhood and agency and spirit in things that aren't human. And there are definitely very strong echoes of this in Old Norse pre-Christian belief, where the line between animal and person is extremely blurred in a lot of cases. Um, animals can be people, they can have personalities, they can have names and life stories. So what we see in zoomorphic brooches might be an echo of a similar thing. Um, and birds in particular are subject to that sort of thing, combination with human features. 
Another place we find lots of references to animals is in Anglo-Saxon riddles. So the Anglo-Saxons had a very strong tradition of riddle writing, and that's often in Old English or it can be in Latin. Um, and they, they tended to focus on animals that straddled taxonomic categories. So if you want to get really anthropological about it, animals that were in the liminal space between taxonomic groups. Um, and this harks back to the snake and worm thing. So in a society where things like evolution and common descent are not known about, it's not always obvious how you should group animals or how certain animals are related to others. So one example of an animal in a riddle is the pond skater. It has four visible legs, it can't swim, but it walks on water. Um, pond skaters actually have six legs, but two of them are very sort of small, um, so you can forgive the author that one. But this is an animal that seems to have properties that conflict with each other. Paul Sorrell's written very extensively about the Anglo-Saxon perception of animals as having a very close and active relationship with their habitat. So there's a lot of emphasis on animals having a proper environment and about how things start to go wrong when animals intrude on environments they're not supposed to be in. Or when they're separated from the environments they are supposed to be in. So a whale is described as being separated from the water, a stranger on land, and it dies. A beaver is described as an intruder in the water. The riddle of the fish and the river says that if the fish and the river are parted, the fish dies. Um, when the dragon is killed in Beowulf, it's described as losing its uvewinness, its wave strife, its movement against the waves. So the implication here seems to be that if a fish is taken out of water, it doesn't die because it can't get enough oxygen. It dies because it's no longer doing what it's supposed to be doing, i.e. swimming, and it's no longer in the environment it's supposed to be in, i.e. the water. And this is why these liminal animals, these sort of animals that seem to have conflicting properties, are particularly interesting in the Anglo-Saxon context because they can't classify them by their evolutionary history in the same way as we would. So if two animals have the same general body layout, they move in the same way and they're found in roughly the same environment, like worms and snakes, they're grouped, uh, they're grouped similarly. So although it was a heavily agricultural period, the way Anglo-Saxons saw their world was absolutely influenced by the wild animals that lived around them, and everything was seen as having its place. Even what we might see today as inconsequential animals like foxes and badgers have places named after them with Anglo-Saxon roots, and the dichotomy between animal and human was definitely not as sharp as it is today. Um, and I'll finish off this little musing with a riddle. Se me fede, sundelm thaute, mech ida rurun, eurdan ye tenge. Fedelause, oftich flode on yaun, muth on tinde, nu will a monna sum, min flash freton. Fell les ne recheth sidon hemel of sidon, sauces orde. Iteth un sodene.